Okay. <clears throat> Hello there. My name is Brianna and I am in my early 30s and I wanted to hop on here on YouTube and share my testimony with whoever stumbles upon this video. Um, I pray that the Lord glorify himself in this and I pray that my testimony and the proclamation of the gospel bring some of you or help bring some of you to him. So, like I said, my name is Brianna. I'm in my early 30s. I've got a wonderful husband and some children and we live in the South. We didn't always. Um, we used to live in Northern California for the majority of our lives and we are both believers and we have the privilege of raising our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we did not always think this way. We did not always believe in the Lord. Um, we actually were quite opposite. We weren't atheists, but um, we were, I would say, agnostic. I grew up, I would have told you I was a Christian, but I was not. I grew up in a household with a wonderful family, um, but we were just very deceived. We thought that being a Christian was just mentally assenting to Jesus being real, and then when you die, you go to heaven. And that was the extent of it. Um, if you sin, you just ask him to forgive you, and that's, that's, that's that. It was very, very simplistic. Um, it was a huge deception. It was a very easy believism, you know, live however you want acknowledge that Jesus is Lord we would probably didn't really even know what that meant we obviously didn't and uh, you go to heaven and it was all about just like it wasn't about loving or having your affections be for Christ it was it was not about Christ at all it was all about just not going to hell Jesus was our ticket to heaven and I don't necessarily know that anyone would have explained it that way at the time, but it's pretty much what it was. I think it's a, unfortunately a misconception a lot of, um, in particular, American Christians have. That it's either, it's one of two things typically I've, fi I've found in my encounters with people. You, they either think you need to be a good person and work your way to God. Kind of like how the Catholic Church is like, have you, has, has you come and confess your sin to the, to the um, priest and then somehow you're right again with God and you know, then you do this amount of Hail Marys and this amount of good works and you're all good. You're back and right, right standing with him. Or there's the other extreme of just believe in Jesus and you go to heaven and don't worry about how you live at all, which was what we believed. Both of those are heresy. Both of those teachings will send you straight to hell. Um, and I didn't know that at the time. I thought I was going to heaven. So did all of my family. And by God's grace, we heard the true gospel proclaimed. And um, he saved me and he started saving some of my family too. So. To start things off, um, like I said, that was uh, the household I grew up in. Wonderful father, wonderful mother, loving people, um, very loving household, very moral household. They held us to, we had really, really great moral teaching. It wasn't Christian, but it was good morals, good ethics. Um, and we grew up and sports kind of became what consumed our lives. So we would occasionally go to church, but sports took over the weekends. And as I got older, um, 
all of the TV shows and movies with all of the romantic um, storylines and relationships kind of fascinated me. So my identity really started to get caught up in relationships. So I jumped around from long-term relationship to long-term relationship. And when I wasn't in one of those, I was sleeping around. Um, a lot of my identity was in how I looked and how I was viewed by men. And I'm not sure I know where that comes from. The only thing I can, cause I had a wonderful relationship with my father and he always instilled like um, great, uh, a great sense of self-confidence in me. And he would always tell me not to put my confidence in these things. But um, for whatever reason, I think it was the shows and the movies and all of those things that I watched, like the romantic comedies, like that's where my happiness would come from. So I got a lot really tied into all of that. And that seems innocent enough, um, but it was actually <laughs> a really sneaky tactic of the devil. So my identity, like all of us, we put our identity in something and it's really funny how we do that. It's really funny how God made us that way to have our identity in something other than ourselves. And it's supposed to be in him. We're supposed to look to him and find ourselves in him. Um, but what we do instead is we have all these counterfeits put our identity in how good we are at sports. We put our identity in how good we are at school. How good we are at work, money, looks, how thin we are, how we're measuring up to people on social media, um, how good we are at something, how good we are to other people. The standard of good is different for everybody, right? Well, my identity was being a good person by my self-righteous standards and uh, being in a romantic, passionate, notebook-like relationship. It's pretty pathetic. And if my relationship wasn't dramatic like that, um, I found ways to make it that way. Mm, put all of my poor boyfriends in high school and college through the ringer. So if any of you guys are ever watching this, I apologize. <laughs> really, really bad. Um, even my husband. My husband's seen the change that happened since I've been saved. So. He knows as well. But anyways, I went through college, um, was drinking, partying, sleeping around, and I decided that I really wanted to make my life matter. So I was like, I'm gonna join the Peace Corps. I'm gonna join the Peace Corps, I'm gonna drop out of college, I'm really gonna make a difference. And I was just grasping at all of these things. Got really into the new age, thought I was super spiritual you know, just being really aware and getting to that next level of um, consciousness. Messing with crystals and the supernatural stuff and all the while drinking, sleeping around, like I said. Inevitably, I got pregnant when I was 19 and I ended up having an abortion when I was eight weeks pregnant. And an abortion is a term people use today to lessen the impact of what's really happening. You are murdering your child when you have an abortion. Um, that's what's happening. It's not a clump of cells, it's a baby. When a dog gets pregnant, the dog has puppies. When a kitten gets pregnant, or excuse me, when a cat gets pregnant, they're pregnant with kittens. They're not pregnant with clumps of cells. When human beings get pregnant, they're pregnant with a human baby. And our culture would like to deceive people into thinking it's a clump of cells. It is not. I have seen both my children on ultrasounds from a very, very, very young, young age, sucking their thumb, playing around in the womb. It's not a clump of cells. Our science is far too advanced for anyone to believe that anymore. Um, Yet that is how I justified what I did. I even saw my child on the ultrasound and I did it anyway. I knew my child had a heartbeat and I did it anyway. Um, we are all radically depraved and in need of a savior. 
and me mentioning the taking of the life of my child and however many more children I did that too because I took plan B and birth control and all those things all the time. Um, the only reason I mention that, and I normally cry when I mention it, um, is because Christ saved me in my sin. This is love that, that he, he died for us even when we were in our sin. So if you're watching this and you are like, I've done something and I'm too far, you're not. You're never too far. You are never too far. Don't let anyone tell you that. Christ can save anybody. So, um, anyways, I moved along in my my journey, and I continued with drinking. I was the fun friend. I was um, the friend who would do really ridiculous, crazy things to make people laugh. Um, I wouldn't have called myself a drug addict, but you know, I did all of those drugs, ecstasy, cocaine. Um, I was living in San Francisco, so that's what you did. You go out, you do all that to stay up late. You have anxiety. You start drinking again in the morning with mimosas because if they're mimosas, then you're not an alcoholic because it's classy to do that, right? You get hammered with vodka, little martinis the night before because that's the classy way to get hammered or wine nights with your girlfriends and then you wake up, you feel horrible, you need to numb it, so you start drinking again. And it's just a cycle. Then you sleep with a new person and all those types of things. So that's what I did. Um, met my husband. We were the fun couple. We were the couple that made everybody laugh. We were the outrageous couple who would, you know, hop on the dance floor when everyone else was embarrassed too. And I mean, we loved being the center of attention. And um, then. My husband had a freak accident. He had a crazy allergic reaction to something and went into anaphylactic shock. Anyways, he lives with that to this day. We carry EpiPens everywhere. And um, I basically, like, like, I was watching him die on the side of the road. It happened when we were, like, driving. And I was on the phone with 911, and he was dying on the side of the road. He couldn't breathe. And cars were driving by us, and no one was stopping. <laughs> and I was just on the phone with 911. And I'm like, he's gonna die in front of me. It was like literally happening in front of me. I'm like, this just happens to like, <laughs> this happens to other people. This doesn't happen. So um, I was like, I'm gonna be one of those people who tells the story of like, I thought like, I never thought it would happen to me, and it happened to me. Like literally, I'm like staring at him, thinking this. Anyways, um, all of it scared me so much that it brought me to my knees and Christ who I had made my last option because you know Christians boring who wants to read the Bible who wants to who wants to live like that like love is love right no one should tell people how to live there's there's not absolute truth everyone's got their own truth it's much easier to believe in a universe that accepts what everyone thinks and it's really funny how a lot of people say they believe in a higher power or the universe or whatever. And everyone's like, yeah, me too. And it's like, oh, like let's compare and contrast what our universe looks like. Like, because there can't be multiple, you know what I mean? Like everyone, everyone makes up God in their own head to suit them. They make up their own God that's like okay with everything they do. You know, thinks what's, what, what is, uh, what's wicked and evil is what they think is wicked and evil. What's good is what they think is good. Their God approves of everything they do and their God totally understands when they mess up. Because their God knows that they're really a good person. Like that was the God I made up in my own head. And then this happened to my husband and it brought me to my knees and I knew who the true God was. It was Jesus and He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I knew it. I knew it. And um, for those of you, as a side note, who don't think there's proof and who want to argue, like, how can you prove that your way is the only way? 
there's plenty of proof. There's plenty of proof if you go and you search for it from reputable, excuse me, reputable sources. Usually that's not the issue though for people. It's that people love their sin. People love their sin too much. They don't want to give it up. It always, like if I said to you, well, okay, what if we gave you all the evidence that you needed? Then would you believe, then would you follow Jesus? Usually the answer is no, because they don't like that, that they have to die to themselves and live to Christ. They don't like that they have to give up being master of their own life and that Christ becomes their master. I get that because that was me. Totally get it. But the Lord swooped in and he pulled me out of the muck and mire and he opened my eyes and my ears and he gave me a new heart. And he made me start hating everything I loved before, all of my sin. And he made me start loving righteousness and loving him and, and wanting to follow him. And the only way to follow him is to know what the Bible says. Before I called myself a Christian, I didn't even know what the Bible said. How can anyone call themselves a Christian and not know what the Bible says? It's a really crazy thing people do in this country. Like, I'm a Christian, but I don't know what being a Christian is. Or like, I'm gonna make up my own definition for being a Christian. Like, that's what, that's what I did. That's what a ton of people I know have done. It's madness. But I started reading the Bible and I'm like, wow. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever should believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. No one comes to the Father but through the Son. And the Son is the way, the truth, and the life. He's not a way, a truth, and a way to life. He's the. Buddhism, Hinduism, New Age, being a good person, universalism, everyone goes to heaven, Judaism, all of it. Islam, I think I said that. Not all way, different ways lead to heaven. Christ is the only way. He's the only way. And um, he just, he changed me from the inside out. He literally gave me all new desires. And it didn't happen overnight. I'm sure for some people it has happened that way. But for me, it was like a season. And it still is going to be a season the rest of my life of him changing me more into his image. But those first couple years of being a Christian, I had things falling off of me that I used to love, that God's like, no, those things aren't good. So <laughs> me liking to drink kind of fell off, like drunkenness, not having a glass of wine, like drunkenness, partying, fell off. Me telling dirty crass jokes fell off, like all these things I started kind of being, being repulsed by. And then like things I used to think were boring, like going to church and being around other Christians and reading the Bible I started loving them. I love those things. I love Christ. My affection is for Christ and his church. And um, God made those desires in me. You guys, I can't make this stuff up. Like all of my friends took off on me the first couple of years I became a Christian. They thought I was a freak of nature. <laughs> and they didn't like that I said there's absolute truth that I just didn't agree with like, oh, whatever makes you happy. I, like I didn't agree with that anymore. Um, there is absolute truth and it's Jesus. And 2000 years ago, he came and he lived a perfect life. The life you and I cannot live because we can't work our way to God. We're dead in our sin, the Bible says. But Jesus did. Jesus lived the perfect life. And then he was nailed to a cross, blameless and innocent. And he took the full wrath of the Father, the judgment and suffering that we deserve for our sin. He took on that cross. He bore it all on that cross. And he died. And on the third day, he rose again so that whoever believes in him can rise to new life too when they place their faith in Christ. 
when they repent and they place their faith in Christ. So that's what happened to me. I realized the way I was going was wrong, and I turned and I looked at Christ, and I said, I want to follow you. And um, he reconciled me to God. Jesus is fully man and fully God. And like I said earlier, whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And it says that he did not come that first time to judge, but he's coming again, and he is coming in judgment that time. And if you're found not in Christ, which means you have not placed your faith in him and you're not, you've decided I don't want to follow him. He's not my Lord and Savior. And for those of you who are claiming Christianity, is he your Lord and Savior? Or is he just Savior? Because that's, that's not biblical. He's Lord and Savior. He is master of your life. Have you submitted your life to Christ? It says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Many of us are going to be bowing and praising and rejoicing that he's coming. And for those who have not placed their faith in Christ, they're going to be forced to bow. And then they're going to be judged. And we go to one of two places. We get to be in the kingdom of God forever with him. Which is beyond what my mind can imagine. Or we face eternal judgment separated from him in hell. I implore you, I implore you, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Ask him to grant you repentance and faith and, and open your Bible. Gospel of John or Gospel of Matthew, start reading. Start listening to men like John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, Tim Conway, Paul Washer, Vodi Bakum. Start listening to them. Start learning. Stop going your own way. The world does not care about your soul. But Jesus Christ does. Jesus does. And if you're listening to the end of this video, <laughs> I hope that um, the Lord uses this to convict you. He is Lord. He is Lord. And it says that we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And what that means in layman terms is that we love our sin, so we don't want to believe in him. When you become a Christian, it's not following a rule book. It's the Lord changing you from the inside out so your desires change, but you need to come to the place where you realize that you are not a good person. You are never going to do good enough works to measure up to God's standard. God is holy and righteous. You are never going to be good before him unless you have the righteousness of Christ which he can give you when you place your faith in him. That's what he did on that cross. He paid the penalty for the judgment that you deserve. And he says, place your faith in me and you get that righteousness. So when you do stand before God, you stand before him blameless and innocent. So that's my testimony. And that is how God radically changed my life and my husband too and <laughs> I pray that some of you come to him whoever watches this I pray that he works in your life 